actor Steve Railsback was studying at the actor's studio when the Manson family murders took place in August of 1969. Seven years later, a television audience of more than 100 million people would witness his searing portrayal of Manson in the film Helter Skelter. Railsback's entry into the film industry was meteoric, having been recruited by none other than Elia Kazan for a film titled The Visitor. But Helter Skelter remains the film for which he is perhaps best known, though he has done equally impressive work in films like The Stuntman, opposite Peter O'Toole, Life Force for director Toby Hooper, and the title role of Ed Gein, which he also produced. Mr. Railsback gave us insights into how he approached the role of Manson, his life-enriching relationship with Elia Kazan, and his depth of passion for the craft of acting. During the interview, you'll also hear stories about the director of Helter Skelter, Tom Grise, as he would die not long after it was aired. Coincidentally, his son, actor Dan Grise, came up in Episode 2 of our Tinseltown Tragedy series. He was the near witness to the murder of actress Krista Helm and the Hollywood Hills in 1977, one year after the premiere of Helter Skelter and shortly following his father's death. So I guess to start out with, this is we're celebrating the, the 40th anniversary of Helter Skelter in, in which you starred. Um, so a good place to start might be where you were when the actual events took place. I would imagine you were studying in New York City at the time. I was in, I was living in New York. Yeah, had been. Yeah. Uh, uh, for a while, and and it was a terrible thing. Yeah. So you have? Do you have memories of when that story first broke? I, I remember uh, where I was. I was at Sheridan Square uh, where you buy newspapers. Bought newspapers at the time? I just bought the newspaper and I saw it. I went, oh, God. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, basically, you know, it, it was all over the papers and stuff. Yeah. But in, ter- in terms of your journey, l- let's talk a little bit about your journey to Helter Skelter, because you were you were studying with the Actors Studio. Um, I was a member I, of the Actors Studio, and still am. You're, once you're a member, you're a lifetime member. Yeah. Yeah. So your uh, how did Kazan come into your life? <laughs> Thank God he's there. Uh, what an incredible <laughs> man. Uh. I'd been doing a lot of plays in New York, a lot of plays. And uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. Uh, sure. Uh, I, was, I, for the, I hadn't been home in three and a half years, but I decided to go home for Christmas uh, to Texas. And so I did. And while I was, I, the phone rang one day. It was a Wednesday. This is important. It was a Wednesday. And the guy on the other end said, uh, it's Steve Rells back there. And I said, uh, yeah, this is him. He said, but this is Kazan from New York. And I let him talk for about 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And then finally I said, okay, who's this really? You know, I thought it was a friend of mine calling up, pretending to be some, you know. I mean... Elia Kazan was a forget it. anyway. So I must have changed about twenty different colors. It was a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. Thursday was New Year's uh, uh, Eve, and Friday was New Year's Day. And he said, uh, "Well, I'm doing this movie, and uh, uh, somebody mentioned your name, and uh, I'm not offering the part. I just want to meet you." And uh, he said, "Listen." Uh, uh, when are you coming back? I said, tonight. He said, no, no, no. Stay home. Spend New Year's Eve with your family. And then on New Year's Day, you come back. And here's my phone number. He gave me his phone number. And call me when you land in New York. And I did. And then he said, asked me if I wanted to come in, uh, to meet him in his office on Saturday. And I did that. We talked for like three hours, 
Mm. And uh, he did that with everybody, but I didn't know that. But we talked for three hours. Then I'd, he asked me if I'd do an improv with uh, with my at the studio on Monday. And I said, yeah. And I did this improv. And on Wednesday, he called me and said I had to lead in this movie. It was, it was, it, it's fake. I, I don't know what it is. I really don't have a clue. But that man was there for me in the good times, the bad times, and the good times. He was, he was always there for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking. I'm talking about after the film, after we made the film. You know, um, well, I mean, he's he, uh, just from a, a movie a movie fan standpoint. I, I mean, it's mm-hmm. obvious that he he loved actors. I mean, he he was he, he was, was the greatest actors director that ever lived. Yes, yeah. And why was that in your ex- experience with him? Because he spoke in specifics. An actor cannot act generalities. I never heard a generality come out of his mouth. And I was with him all the time for years. I'd finish the movie here and fly there just to be with him. You know, he, uh, he, he never spoke in general terms. But an actor can't act a general generality. So anyway, yeah. uh, look at who he gave their first opportunity to. <laughs> Look at the long list, and uh, but he ne- he was he became like my father. He was just there for me. He was there for me all the time. And uh, did, I miss did him he, a lot. In that in that film, uh, what do you did he bring something out of you that su- surprised even you? No, what he did was in that three-hour conversation, he knew more about me than I knew about myself, if you know what I'm saying. Hmm. There was a reason for that three-hour conversation. I didn't know that until later. Because he would walk up and whisper something in my ear that would be a specific to me. Wow. And to somebody else, a specific to them. You know? And he, mm-hmm. so he knew so much about me. He knew what made me tick. He knew what made, you know, so he had whispered something in my ear, a word, uh, not much more, you know, two or three words, whatever, one word, you know. But it was specific, specific, specific. And it was to me, it was, and it was specific to me. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know absolutely. And you know, you would think. Uh, I mean, that's a good point to bring up because I, I think a, a lot of great directors uh, understand, have a natural empathy, and same with actors, and understand people. They understand human be- behavior and desires and the human makeup. I mean, they're students of that. That's that's an artist mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. So, so um, to get to Helter Skelter, which came a few years later, th- that opportunity came about for from an audition, didn't it? Helter yes, Skelter sir. came about. Let's see. I'd been. Uh, I went back. I, I I did a couple more movies, uh, but but God, I was always with Kazan. But uh, uh, I was doing a play on Broadway and uh, Skin of Our Teeth. And uh, I got this call from somebody that said, uh, you want to come out uh, and uh, you should come out and, and uh, I'll just uh, help you skelter or whatever. So I, I, I did. I, uh, I drove across country in my closest friend's car, Lane Smith. I don't know if you remember Lane, but one of our great actors passed away. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, let's see. Um, I got in there. I walked. I walked in. 
I don't know. You know, there's a, there, when you walk off of a Broadway stage, it's not arrogance. It's not that. There's a confidence that comes from that, uh, from walking off a stage, any stage, because your imagination is just flowing. So I went in and I read a uh, speech. The court, some piece the of paper. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. some piece of paper. And I got a call a couple of days later asking off of me to park. And there were a lot of people. My God, a lot of people went to park. Uh, yeah, and, it's interesting because there, there's, a, there's actually a story – uh, about the number of people that they, that wanted that part, and and I actually read something. I don't know if it's a rumor or not that they had approached Martin Scorsese at one point before they started auditioning for it. Have you heard that before? No, no. I, I know Martin Sheen wanted to play the part. Wow. I don't, wow. I didn't know about Scorsese. Mm. Well, why did they approach him? Was he acting? Then? Uh, no, I, I, that was actually the year that he acted for the first time in, in Taxi Driver. But uh, I, I guess they just saw his look <laughs> at, at a Oh, him I, the, I have no idea. It's very possible. I have no idea. But I so you felt that, that you, you felt possible. that this was a coveted role, though, obviously. Yeah, I did. But I'll tell you, and this type of thing comes back in my life. He's always there. I actually turned it down. And uh, I don't know why. I, uh, you know, I just, the, my confidence level was so high. Uh, and uh, I got this phone call. Apparent, uh, Kazan was out here uh, uh, casting, uh, uh, God, my mind went blank. The film he did with De Niro. Um, Last Last Tycoon. Yeah, he was out here casting Last Tycoon, and, and uh, I got this phone call from Irene, his, his longtime secretary, and she said, uh, Steve, she says, uh, Mr. Kazan's on the phone. He'd like to talk to you. And I said, okay. I said, yeah. And he got on the phone. He said, how you doing? I said, fine. He said, uh, how'd the play go? I said, oh, it went great. And uh, I thought it went really good. And uh, he said, uh, that's great. He said, so what are you up to? And I said, well, I want to play this uh, Manson, uh, about Manson. And uh, he said, so? I said, oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I type in or whatever. I, I don't know why. I, I, I just said, no. He said, well, that's stupid. That's a Hollywood term. He said, listen to me. Uh, who's your accident? I said, a guy named a man named uh, Tom Grice. And he goes, Tom, Tom Grice? Grice, Tom. Tom, he says, no, I don't know. He says, Tom Grice. He says, oh, my God, Tom Grice. He says, you've got to do it. He says, he, he's incredible. You've got to do it. If you want to, he says, come by the studio. We'll go to the script wall, page by page, but you've got to do it. You've got to do it. I said, God damn. I said, you feel like that? I'm doing it. <laughs> so I, I hung up from him, and I called up Tommy. I said, I want to do it. I'm doing it. And wow. about five weeks later, I'm on the set with Tommy, and we're sitting in director's chairs, and we're talking. And he starts to laugh, and he said, did Kazan call you? I said, yeah. He says, you know, we've been friends for 25 years. I called him up. I said, would you call this fucking kid up and tell him <laughs> to do this damn part? <laughs> so the whole thing was an act. But that's well, what I mean. He came. He's always there for me. You know, and and he, Kazan. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, he was right about Tommy Grice. I love Tommy. But, but uh, uh, he... Yeah, and 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 I, I you got to remember back then there was only ABC, NBC, CBS who did the show CBS. Yeah, and and two independents. There weren't five hundred channels, so you you'd never get the ratings we got. 
but with 500 cha- uh, you know 500 channels it was only those and over 100 million people watched it and um wow well, you know uh well let me ask you this I'm about very, television because I mean, in terms of actors today, I mean, television at one point had this kind of stigma attached to it, as far as actors and and Hollywood level creative talent. But but now, I mean, it's it's a, just a feast of great uh, great material. At that time, you were uh, you had a thriving stage career. You were in in movies. You worked with Kazan. I, I don't. Uh, did, think did you have any of those think, feelings about yeah. TV? No. I don't think about those things. And I, I think people were starting to lay off of that after a while. You know, it did. It never occurred to me. I just yeah. love acting. I love the work. I, I, I love this work. I love a craft. I love this craft. And, you know, people see uh, Manson. Because they see me and they see Manson and this and that, but they don't know. I take a negative. I cannot act. It's impossible to act the negative. I can only act the positive. So I have to. So that's where the the craft comes in. Choices, choices, choices. And I'm acting a positive. You may think I'm talking about something, like in the speech. I'm talking about. These, all these things, you have no idea what I'm thinking and talking about, and it has nothing to do with that. Mm. What it really had to do with, I was talking about actors, and you have no right, no right, to take their talent away. A snide remark. Uh, and you don't have a right to take yeah. their gift away. So my that's where my passion is. So my passion comes out of that. It comes out of choices. Now, the choices have a through line. I know who it was that was uh, in New York, two, two people that were trying to take my confidence because one was jealousy, the other was something uh, stupid. Uh, uh, And they were the ones that were putting me on trial. And I couldn't do anything about it. I said, go for it. It's okay. You see, what I'm getting to is I was telling them in this speech that you have no right to do that to anybody. But you see Manson. But that's where the passion comes through. Yeah. You know, and then you have a through line. I've got a through line when I know who it is that's doing this to me and 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 all this. That's my through line. And in that through line I make choices, 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 choices. I act the positive. Because how can you act a negative? You can't. There are people that may try, but it's bullshit. It's well, I understand fact. what you're saying, and and that's that's a that's a part because you, 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 actors and I know that you feel the same way. Actors always talk about the, the importance of not judging your character because even, never judge even, character, never. Yeah, it, even if you play a villain, I mean, the villain is the hero of his own story. I mean, the, he, he can yes, do some Yes, well, you can that. do that. Yes, but you can also play a positive. Make that villain a positive. Make it personal. And, and, and you can do it that way, too. You can also rationalize anything. Mm. I'm just not into rationalizing negativity. Right, right. Uh, but I will make you believe it. I will. I'll put everything I've got into it. And so, can you can you tell me the process by which you came to understand how you would approach Manson? I just told you. Okay. <laughs> it hit me one day. Yeah. Why I was going on trial? Well, I knew who it was that was doing it. 
it came down to this. It got me. It put me up here. They want me to defend myself, this and that. They want to take it all away from me, all my confidence, all my this and that, everything. Nothing I can do. Go ahead. Do it. And then I make choices within that. And um, so when I gave that speech, I was talking to them. And I was talking about actors who I adore, by the way, I respect. But I, I was talking about don't ever try to take their gift away. You have no right. It's theirs. And you, if I could, I'd take this microphone and I'd beat your brains out with it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's not about, it's about the point I'm trying to make. Who do you think you are? I always make choices. Acting to me is about choices. Choices, 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 choices. And it's a craft. It's a craft that, you know, I was teaching for a little while, and I stopped, but I was teaching for a little while, and I'd, I'd get up, and I'd make a speech, and I'd say, I will never hurt you, I will never lie to you, and I will never ask you to do anything I haven't done thousands of times. Mm. You know, this is a craft. I learned that I was, I'm so fortunate as a human being. I, I When I first got to New York, September the 28th, 1967, I, I woke up, I stayed at a place called the Hotel Lucerne, and it was raining, by the way, that night. But I I, um, I went downstairs to the telephone. They had telephone booths back then, and uh, people won't remember those. But uh, <laughs> I uh, went through the yellow pages, and I was looking under T for uh, theater or D for drama. I wasn't sure. I was looking for an acting class, and I found one, and it was a... Uh, that that sounds interesting. It was on the eighth floor of Carnegie Hall. Fake, 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 fake. It was on the eighth floor of Carnegie Hall. But that's not what got me. It was the place. I mean, the the uh, this uh, mm-hmm. it, it, this teacher this uh, teacher, and I went, and I was there for about three weeks, and I, I something hit me. I'd never been in a class. But something hit me that was very general. Now, I found out that Lee Strasberg taught his private classes on the 10th floor of Carnegie Hall. Now, what are the odds of me going through the yellow pages and picking a school that was on the 8th floor of Carnegie Hall (laughs) and Lee Strasberg happened to be on the 10th floor? What are the – that's fake. Fate, fate, fate. I really believe in fate. And yeah. and so I'd left that class, but I'd sneak upstairs, and the door would be a little bit open. I'd just listen to what Lee was saying, because I knew Lee Strasberg was. I was just listening. And somebody came up to me. His name was Walter Lott, who became a big influence on me. But Walter Lott came up to me. He was a member of the actor's studio, and he was um, helping Lee out, and he was uh, secretary of his class. And he came up and he says, uh, you know, I've noticed you out here uh, just listening. Uh, you know, you're not really supposed to do that. He said, let me tell you how to get into the class. You may not get in, but I'll, I'll tell you what you do. You have a snapshot taken. It's a snapshot. And then you write a letter. And he gave me Lee's address. He says, you write a letter to Lee and you tell him why you want to study with Lee Strasberg. In other words, Lee is opposed to somebody else. Why do you want to study with Lee? And he gave me his address, and I wrote this letter. I don't remember what I wrote in the letter, but I know it came from my heart. He called me. His secretary called me and said Lee wanted to meet with me at his brownstone. And I went there, and... uh, we talked for a few minutes, and he says, I want you to come to my class. But, it, you know, and and then it started. But the point is, what are the odds of all the schools 
books and all the places I could have studied that I picked a place on the eighth floor of Carnegie Hall, not even knowing or having a clue that Lee was on the tenth floor of Carnegie Hall. Mm. It's fate. It has to be fate. <laughs> I mean, my God, there's a million places you can study. It's fate. And I started studying with Lee. Oh, and it was special. And I started learning this craft, this craft. And it's not about the Tuesday, uh, the, the 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 days the class were in the day. It's it's not about the two days a week. It's not about that. It's about every day. You live it. You sleep it. You, yeah, it's you. you that's all you do. I'd walk down the street doing these exercises. I did them 24-7. I mean, I lived it. It was my life just doing these exercises. I can't get people to do them. They, they have problems with them doing them in a classroom. They, and then they go home and they don't do anything. You got to, you got to want something so bad that you do it every day. You live it, and every night you live it. Or don't do it, especially this business. So I, I, oh. Give me an example, Go because I have, I, I have a great interest in acting, um, and I've read the, you know, I've read the the trilogy of Stanislavski books, and I've I've done a lot of local acting and so forth. Um, and I'm always curious about the actor studio and, and Lee Strasberg's teaching methods in particular. Give me an example of a lesson. Well, actually, Kazan class. founded the studio. Uh, Kazan and and uh, uh, Cheryl Crawford and, and uh, they founded the studio. But but that's not the point. Uh, uh, Lee came in in '52 and, and, and became Lee's school. Lee, Lee had the greatest eye in the world. He could see things, and I'm watching the scene being done. This is after I got to see it. I'm, wa- I'm watching the scene being done, and I would totally miss it, and everybody else would too. He could, he has an eye that would point right in and pick up something you couldn't, nobody else could even see that was so important for that actor mm. in that thing. You understand? Yeah. He had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant eye. And uh, just to get back to Helter Skelter for just a second, um, the, the uh, you didn't meet with Manson because that would have affected you. No, performance. they asked me to. They asked me to if I wanted to meet him because they had set it up. And I said no, because I didn't want him to manipulate me into thinking he was something he wasn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't want his interference. My point was, I already made my I made my choices, and and, and you know I I have a certain way of working. I don't need his influence. I don't need him. Uh, that's not, you know, that's my whole life. You know, my mother. I got to tell you this. This is I'm looking at this book right now. My mother was a wonderful lady, and when I was 14, I was so. I would watch a film, you see, and I'd always wonder, how did that actor get to there? How did uh, Paul Newman and Todd r- reach those emotional moments? Where do they come from? Are they acting or are they this or they that or that? So when I was 14, I went to the school. That there was a local small college in Wichita Falls, Texas, uh, called Midwestern University, and I... I got this book. There's a lot of nickels on this on this book. I uh, got it from the library. And hello, it's uh, yeah. uh, building the character, Stanislavski. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting the things that I underlined in this and that at fourteen. You know, uh, I just go back and I look at the underlinings, what I underlined. I don't know. 
It's just interesting too. But my when my mother passed away, it was in a box. She had saved it all these years for me. It was so special. Um, I don't know. I keep getting off subject here. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. And you still have that book, that same book. I was just had it in my hand. I was reading. I was oh. looking at it. In my hand. Mm. My mother saved it for me. It's, we, we brought up Manson, but uh, did you hear from him or anyone associated with him after the movie about your the film or your performance no. in it? Okay. No, no, I didn't. Uh, 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 I mean, the National Enquirer put something in about having to drag him away. You know, that's all bullshit. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but. Um, but did you um, notice? Because you, I mean, you're saying that this, the I mean, the movie was seen by 100 million people. It's one of the still one of the most watched non-sport yeah, television is. events in history. Uh, I mean, with that many people have eyes on you, did you notice a difference after that uh, show aired to how people oh, approached of course. you? Or, yeah. Yeah. No, no, it was great. The exposure was incredible. But you see. There's Kazan coming back in. He always... I just love that. I'm sorry. I can't... Uh, and, and and Tommy, I've got to tell you, I before I did the speech, I passed by Tommy, and I just said real low, I said, watch me on this, Tommy, because I don't know what's going to happen. And I didn't. I just knew what I was going to do, but I didn't know what was going to happen. We did it in one take, actually, with three cameras, and that would only happen. That would only happen. Uh, uh, I have no idea how to, it just happened. Uh, you know, usually it would never happen like that. It ends when I stand up uh, yeah. to go to the girl. And uh, I said, Tommy, watch me on this because uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And he had a great eye, Tom. And uh, I went up and uh, I asked everybody if they could uh, please uh, uh, let me, because they were talking, uh, and uh, I, I have something I have to say. And uh, please let me say it. It's important. And they all sat down. Everybody sat down. And Tommy waited about 20 seconds or so, and he called action. And I just started. But I knew who I was talking to. You know, I never went to school. I never did this. But I do know. You see, it's all it all fits. You see, but I knew who I was talking to. And it just came. And I, I didn't even, there were times I'd sit there and I'd just, I, I, could, I couldn't say a word. And then I just, I, it just happened. It was a, um, it's one of those rare things. That, and I got to tell you, when I stood up and they called cut, I felt like a thousand pounds had been lifted off my soldiers because I got it out. I got it out. I got it out. And everybody stood up applauding. There were some people crying. It, 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 anyway, all I cared about was Tommy. And he started walking through. I said, Tommy, come on, let's go back here. And we went backstage. We were on a Warner Brothers. Uh, they built this court on Warner Brothers and uh, he said yeah and he put his arms on my shoulder and I said Tommy tell me he said it was brilliant Steve it was brilliant listen to the response oh and then he said but Steve I can't use a foot of it and I just I said why he said, because Manson will get 100,000 more followers. Mm. Now, I said, no way. I said, 
I just shook my head and I just, I don't know how else to do it, Tom. I don't know how else to do it. And he looked at me and he looked at me and he looked at me and he said, then it stays. And when they were trying, you know, that you have to cut some side to get it down to where it's four hours or three hours and nine minutes so the commercials can come in. They wanted to touch the, the uh, they wanted to cut, uh, somehow touch the, uh, uh, take take something out of the speech. Some, he would not let them touch it. Hmm. And this is the same man that said he couldn't use a foot of it. I just love him so much. I miss Tommy. We lost him way too early. Yeah, that was one of the last things he he directed before he passed. He he directed Ali after that. But the thing is, yeah. he passed at 53. Instant heart mm-hmm. attack plan. And this is a big man. Uh, you, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, it's, um, uh, playing tennis. Uh, we just lost him way too too early, and I think about him a lot. Wow. Your um, I want to ask you something because you 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 grew up in Texas, you moved to New yes. York to pursue to pursue your dream, uh, and and that the the story of of Manson and that whole helter skelter story it encompasses a lot of, you know, uh, Los Angeles and what's unique about that area uh how do you take to, to the los angeles area i mean what are your impressions of that environment in general well let me tell you when i came out here to do this i uh i never paid more than a hundred dollars a month for an apartment you gotta understand they had <laughs> in new york they they, they had uh, rent control so i paid a hundred hundred twenty five dollars for an apartment. but anyway when i came out here i could not sleep mm. For the first almost week, I was out here because, and, and I realized it's because I was so used to the trucks at night. Yeah, it's yeah. always noise at night in New York. Yeah, <laughs> there was nothing. It's like they rolled up the sidewalks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I couldn't sleep. No, Los Angeles didn't come to my mind as far as. Uh, as far as playing the part, but uh, I, I think it started in San Francisco, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But there, there, I mean, there's there. I mean, if you go to LA today, I mean, the, the, uh, I, I live in Florida, obviously, but the, I just took a trip to LA recently, and and the Manson, for lack of a better word, the Manson lore culture. Uh, you can still feel it there. I mean, he looms he looms large in that city. Well, that's uh, sad, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. But did you when tell me about the aftermath of Helter Skelter because this is such an indelible character. I mean, he's America's boogeyman in a lot of ways. Uh, no, he's also you... America's hero. Which I don't get. Uh, you right. know, not American, but uh, certain people. You know, I, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Mm. I would never, ever. I don't judge people, but I also don't. I play a positive anyway. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I never judge a character. But afterwards, I'll tell you everything I think of him. I had to listen to his fucking music. <laughs> all the time I did I'd listen to it yeah. because I, I listened for whatever fucking awful but anyway um, uh, I would never have said any of this by the way while I was doing it right I understand uh, yeah. but uh, uh, um, what, what did you how just did, ask me how, how did playing that role how did it affect the course of your oh. career afterwards well, I actually, uh, I was offered every killer in town, whether it was a television or feature. Mm-hmm. I was offered, offered to Railsback because they—that's what they do—is they pigeonhole. 
they love to do that because they they figure oh he can do that but he couldn't do it you know it, it, it's bullshit these fucking people but anyway um uh so i i didn't work for close to a year because i turned everything down now i could have had chicken ranch but no career oh because if you turn something down back then they they figured you wanted more money <laughs> so they'd offer you more money mm. i I'd, I'd still turn it down that and yeah, I didn't want to do it. So anyway, and then uh, that man happened. Yeah, which was my favorite so picture. A, it's a good thing you held out. It's a good thing you said no. So so you you could be well. I had to say because I knew in my mind that if I had done this, that's it. I would have been. I uh, had a lot of money and no career. Yeah, nothing. So anyway, I, I was then offered stuntman working with a, one of the most brilliant people we've lost, Peter O'Toole. Mm. And the director of that, Richard Rush, is a genius. Mm. Yeah. And I, I love that. And then I did from here to Eternity, where I played Robert E. Lee Pruitt, a uh, six-hour miniseries. And uh, things just started happening. You know, but I had to hold out. And it, it, when you don't ever have money, much money in your life, it's hard to turn down a whole bunch of money for simple, stupid things, you know. But it wasn't hard because I knew I had to. I didn't have a problem with it because I knew I had to wait it out. I'm glad they liked it so much that they wanted me to do it again. I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> just to, in another thing, you know, uh, but uh, uh, that's their problem. It's not mine. I'm an actor. That's what I do. I just love it. I thank God every day for for how faith has treated me, how, how, how much I've learned. I used to. Kazan taught me so much. He taught me. I'd go to his farm or I'd go to his uh, townhouse in, in, in New York. we just walk. we just talk. and we just talk about acting, talk about people. And, and he would always talk to people. Yeah. And I, I know why. And I do too. Because you know something? I don't know it all. And I'll never know it all. And the and the death gets in the way of knowing anymore. That's just a fact. I try to learn something every day. Just talking to people. Doing whatever. I want to learn everything I can until I can't anymore. Does that make sense? Because you yeah. never stop learning. Once you know it all, that's the beginning of the fall. And that's my expression. And that's the truth. Well, and that's one of the ways that acting is so exciting is, I mean, it forces you to continue that exploration. I mean, that's what yeah, it's Yeah, if you give it to if you don't yeah. believe your own PR, and, and you, and you want to keep learning and learning and learning, then... You know, now there's something there's something new, and I know that – I think you've been involved in it. Uh, in the past 15, 20 years, there's been kind of the, the, the fan convention. So so people are able to interact with their audience, so to speak, one-on-one. -on -one. Have, have you participated in those kinds of conventions? Yeah. Uh, I've done about four of them, I think. I, I, I like people. I love people. Yeah. Talk, 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 talk. And um, I do panels where I talk about the work. No, but I, they're nice people. Yeah, they really they are. are, and I learn a lot from them. What do you What do you think of the 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 craft of film and the craft of acting today, and how it's evolved since when you started? Well, I don't know about the craft of acting because I, 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 as much as I, I, I think a lot less people want to learn. 
a craft as opposed to, but I'm not talking about, there's some great actors out there, don't get me wrong, but there's also a lot of people that want to just come here and I think it's reality, I don't know what it is, but they want to learn lines and then say them back to each other. Yeah. That's not what it's about. Uh, and and uh, what was the other part of the question? No, that's essentially it. I mean, I, I wanted to know your uh, uh, yeah. I and I think they the everything's about the future. Everything's about this and that. Uh, I, I don't know. I some things are good. Uh, some things are great. By the way, I thought April Eight was incredible. Yeah. Uh, certain certain things are are, are still great. You re- you return to kind of the uh, a, a, a genre role with uh, Ed Gein. D- didn't you also exec produce that? Yeah, I they brought me that actually as a uh, slasher movie, and I said no, I don't want to do it. I said, but if you want to make it a character study, that I'd be interested in. Mm. So they rewrote it, and we shot the ninth draft. And it's all factual. We actually use real footage. And it was taken from all five books that were written by him. And uh, we used some actual footage at the time. And uh, what was the key to yeah. what was the key to unlocking that character for you? Well, see, the thing about Ed Gein is he's still the opposite of Manson. Manson's an extrovert. He dies over the table. Uh, Ed Gein is an introvert. He can't do it, make a decision for himself without talking to his mother, who's dead. And he sees her. But he, it's all in his mind. Most of that, almost all of Ed Gein takes place in his mind. But I wanted to do a character study. So I wanted to show as many colors as I could. That made him up. I knew he was schizophrenic. Uh, all, all the uh, all the characteristics, the, the kids playing cards, goldfish for the kids, all that stuff. I wanted to show all sides. Yeah, that's all I cared about, and uh, I hope I did that. I'm very proud of that performance. I'll be honest with you. You should be. It's a good performance, and and it's a good performance. It's a great performance because of what you just said, because usually these these kinds of movies they they want to play up the uh, you know the 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 negativity of it. The that they want to separate they want, these people from actually being human. <laughs> they want to separate that, the humanity. That's exactly from. what they do, the, yeah. and they and they want to show blood and all this, but. People may be sick, but they are human. Yeah. And all I wanted to do was just show all colors. And I had the privilege of researching him because it took three months to get the nice draft. I had to, I researched him uh, and, and prepped him for uh, three months, which is a luxury. Mm. And uh, where was he from? Where was Aguin from? Wisconsin. But Wisconsin, you know, I, okay. I, uh, uh, real quick, I, I have a book called DSM three and DSM four too, but I was using DSM three then. And that's what the psychiatrist at UCLA use, and I'm in it. You're in it. Everybody's in it somewhere, <laughs> but. Um, I was looking under, I, I, they kept referring and everything I read about him, that he had a sly smile. And I had, it was killing me because I didn't know if he was hiding something or or what what it was. Well, they didn't have a diagnosis for him. But anyway, I was looking at DSM-4, a DSM-3, and, and I was, I found a certain schizophrenia and it gives you, Everything about it, read it, and then it gives you characteristics. And I'll never forget this. I was looking down there, and then I looked at the characteristics, and I went, uh-huh. 
It was the third one that said, a sly smile. Mm. And I woke up the whole house. I just hit a gold mine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he didn't even know he was doing it. That's what I learned from that. It's part wow. of the schizophrenia he had. He did not even know he was doing it. So it wasn't a, it was, it, it wasn't, he wasn't hiding anything. To me, that was a gold mine. But you understand what I'm saying. And I, I woke up completely. my house. I woke up well, my house. I was so happy. Well, that's one of those moments of discovery you live for as an actor. When you that's a nugget. Like that's that. what you have to look for. Those small, little. I mean, that's not small. That smile he had. He know. He was. You know. Mm. It was a. It was a characteristic of the schizophrenia. It was number three. I just never will forget number three. <laughs> so, would you would you would you play such indelible characters like this? Is it are they hard to shake off? No, they're not hard to shake off because once I've got somebody, I've got somebody. I had three months to get a game, and uh, a friend of mine was on the set. He'd say it was he'd watch me. I'd be in my trailer. And Carrie would come in sometimes. I'd known Carrie for 20 years. And I said, I said Carrie's playing Mama. She was great in it. And uh, uh, he said, he knows I'd walk out of the trailer to go to the farm, you know, shoot at the farm. And about halfway to the farm, he'd, I'd change in the head. That's what he would say. But I wouldn't. I, I did. I mean, I, I just knew him. I knew who he was because of all the research I did. 